somebody, but um, we'll assume CJ stole from Johnny, it, and and Johnny finds out. And if Johnny Johnny needs to go to CJ, hey man, you've sinned. I had a guy steal my Bible once. I went to him privately. He denied it, which is really weird. And later on, he came back and he's like, hey, you know what? I, I did steal your Bible. I'm sorry. Um, but if I never said anything, I don't know how he would have lived with that. I mean, he would have gone the rest of his life with a stolen Bible, which is a weird thing. Um, but the concept there being, in that particular scenario in my life, I didn't go and gossip. I, I would imagine most of us can think of a time in our lives where we knew of something that we should have addressed with a particular individual, but instead we just, we just let it go. Man, these are souls. Souls are at stake. Sin doesn't just say, sin doesn't just condemn the person who sinned, and the acu- but it can condemn the accuser if the accuser takes on their own sin by ignoring it or by misusing it or by backbiting with it. But sin also, sin also, that sin can spread to the bystander. What if a person is sinning, and it's in such a way, and I know about it, but I don't do anything about it, and then other people learn of the sin, and then what happens? What would happen in a situation where CJ stole from Johnny? I found out. What should I do? Well, it's a personal sin. I should, I should go and handle it with him. But what if I don't? This is probably easier to go with if it's, say it's, say it's uh, gossip. It's probably easier if you're saying gossip. What if I'm in the rumor mill? All these people are gossiping about something, and, and there's that rumor mill, and I know about it, but I don't correct it. Then John and Jess place membership. They're a nice, sweet, young couple. What they don't know is that we have this giant gossip mill that runs here. What's going to happen to them within six months of being here? They're either going to be, they say, what are those people doing? and make a statement about, hey, y'all, y'all, I mean, y'all are in sin and leave. Or they're going to what? They're going to come right into that gossip mill, aren't they? What should I have done when I, when, when I recognized that there was, there was this gossip going around everywhere? You cut it off. Incidentally, do you know how to stop gossip? You just, huh? Exp- you expose it? You, I, I tell you, the most effective thing I found is you go to the source that you heard it from somewhere, right? And you say to them, oh, you know this firsthand or you heard this from somebody? And they say, oh, I heard it from so-and-so. And you say, well, that was sin. And so you need to repent of that and you need to go back to that person and you need to find out if they saw this firsthand or if they heard it from someone. And if they heard it from someone, you need to say that was sin and you need to go find out. Did they see this firsthand or they hear it from someone? Because everyone who didn't see this firsthand sinned and the person who saw it firsthand sinned because they passed it on to those other people. And the person who saw it firsthand or knows it from firsthand, it may not even be true, but if it is true, they need to go and deal with it in the biblical way. Um, and, and you say, I can go with you. Would you like, let's go together and go talk to that person. But the bottom line is, if you don't do something like that or something biblical and godly with this gossip mill, it's just going to run forever and it's going to corrupt other people. Church discipline protects the bystander. What if I all of a sudden determine that I can just go play basketball out here with my shirt off? And so you drive up next Wednesday night. It's before services. I wouldn't do it during Bible class. Before services. And I'm out here playing basketball, and I've got just a pair of shorts, and i got no shirt on. What would happen? <laughs> it would run. I would scare people away just by wearing shorts because they got chicken legs. But yeah, if I so I take my I take my shirt off and you pull up, what would you, what would happen? Yeah, Miss Lynn was telling me go put a shirt on. What are you thinking? But what if nobody said anything? What if nobody was like, well, I don't want to say anything because I mean, you know, Matt might Matt might get mad at me. I don't want to say anything. And no, and everybody's like, well, somebody else will say something. Everybody's like, ah, oh, somebody else will say something. What is gonna happen if nobody says anything and I do this every Wednesday night for a few weeks? couple months and we're going to end up having shirts and skins out there why yeah 
Yeah, what is, what is the teenage guy here going to say when he says, well, I mean, Matt, he, he got his shirt off. And I work out, so I might as well go out there and take my shirt off. Right? <laughs> Why not? I mean, Matt's got his shirt off. I can take my shirt off. It's hot. Nobody said anything. Miss Lynn just drove by, didn't say a word. Church discipline, church discipline is for the protection of the church. That's where we are tonight in, in Acts chapter 5. To understand Acts chapter 5, you have to understand Acts chapter 4. Something awesome has happened. That Bible verse that we love so much, when, uh, when, when uh, they stand up to the, to the rulers and they say, uh, whether it's better for us to obey God or men, that verse is right here in Acts chapter 4, and, and, and they're told, you don't preach anymore in, in Jesus' name. And he says, well, whether it's right for us to obey God or the men, you judge. They said, we're going to preach the things that we have seen. And they stood up. And then they went, and, and they were warned, and they were threatened, and they went and they prayed with the brethren. And uh, the church is just encouraged. So when you're getting toward the end of Acts chapter 4, the church is encouraged by the boldness of these gospel preachers who, who in the face of, of persecution, say, we're, we're going to do what's right. But then something happens. It says um, in verse 32, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that anything, any of the things he possessed was his own. That's very important. The attitude was, the things I possess do not belong to me alone. So in this particular time, in this particular situation, under this persecution, these people have drawn together and said, we have our things in common. Now watch. But they had all things in common. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great, and great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the proceeds and the things that were sold. The people that own these lands are bringing the proceeds of their lands. And it says all who own them were bringing them, right? Do we understand that a precedent has been set here? Now watch what happens. Verse 35, they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But, verse, verse, chapter 5 starts with the word but, and you know this is going to go downhill because everything is going great. Everything is wonderful. We've stood up to these rulers. Our preachers are very bold men. We've got all these Christians coming together and, and seeing to the needs of other Christians. Everyone's selling their land. Everyone's giving of their means. No one is lacking. Even Barnabas has gone and done this. But, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. People say, what's the big deal here? So what? They gave 80%. They didn't give 20 I don't understand why God gets so upset with this. And that's because they did not read Acts chapter 4 and the verses leading up to this. It's not the fact that they couldn't give 80% of the proceeds of their land to the church if they wanted to. Of course they could. It's that they, under an established precedent sought to deceitfully do something with their possessions. Everyone's giving everything, and they come and lay it at the apostles' feet as if they are doing the same thing, and they are not. They're being dishonest. I, I, in preparation for this, I read an article, and this man, actually, I think he made a video on this. Uh, one of, this one was a video. And he was explaining the truth about Ananias and Sapphira. And he said, you know what the truth about this is? The truth about this is they were not Christians. They were Pharisees trying to infiltrate the church. And I was like, that is insane. And then I saw an article that said the same thing. They probably watched that guy's video. And in the article, they said, you know what? The Holy Spirit should have just gone ahead and told us that in the passage so we'd understand it better. So as a side note to this, first of all, if you read something in the Bible and then you interject some crazy theory and then you get on to the Holy Spirit for not telling you that your theory is correct... That is the horrible hermeneutic. 
And people do this with Ananias and Sapphira, not that extreme, but they do this Ananias and Sapphira all the time where they try to interject something. Well, maybe this happened. Well, maybe that happened. The bottom line is, what do we know happened with Ananias and Sapphira? First of all, there's no mention of them being Pharisees. By the way, the reason these people are grasping at straws here for Ananias and Sapphira is they can't deal with the fact that God struck Christians dead because they believe that Christians cannot fall from grace. And here Ananias and Sapphira sinned. Not only did they sin, but let's watch what happened. Their sin was addressed in the appropriate manner. They sinned publicly because what was happening was they were coming to the assembly and laying this at the apostles' feet, so the sin was public. They had lied to the entire church, and, and, and actually they're going to uh, directly say who it was they lied to in that action. But watch this. When they came, it said that his wife knew about it, but watch verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not in your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but God. All sin is first and foremost against God. We know this because David took Bathsheba from her husband. David committed adultery with her. David murdered her husband. But when you go and read the psalm and, and, and he is repenting of this, he says in the psalm, he says, against you alone have I sinned. Did David sin against God only? No, the idea there is who is the, who is the primary uh, uh, offended party anytime we sin? And the answer is God. If I sin against John, I sin against God. As a matter of fact, we know this from Saul of Tarsus. When he's traveling on the road to Damascus, Jesus says, Saul, why do you persecute me? What you do to mine, you do to me. Every sin we commit is against God, and that's understood here. He tells him, he says, you have not lied. And there's a more specific reason here that he's, lied, that he's, that he's sinned against God, and they're going to get into that. Watch what he says in the next verse. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all who heard these words things. Did the rebuke save Ananias? No. Did the rebuke help to protect the church? Yes. I guarantee you that at least for a time, no one made plans for an 80-20 split with their offering. Moreover, moreover, those who might have grumbled against the men of God of that day, they're not grumbling against them right now. They're not going to come up there and call into question whether or not these men who are speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are speaking the truth. Because that man just said, you lied to the Holy Spirit and he fell down dead. We understand, like with Balaam's donkey, that this is not a direct correlation to what we do today. We don't... Com we don't say something to somebody and then they, they fall. Another guy that I, was, uh, I watched a video on him, he was talking about a, a preacher who used to go around saying the days of Ananias and Sapphira shall return. No, they shall not. Nope. They're not going to return. People are not going to start falling down dead because they sin and lie about it, because they lie to the Holy Spirit. That's not going to happen. There is a judgment day where we'll answer for the deeds and done in the body. But that will not happen upon the earth. So we understand that this is not a direct application, but what we do need to understand is the principle here. Why go through this process? Let me ask you this. Why did Ananias and Sapphira not get home and fall down dead? Why bring them forth and lay the condemnation on them of having lied and have them fall down dead? Why, why do this? Why, why, watch what happens with, with, with Sapphira. It said, well, verse 6, he says, And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. But watch this in verse 7. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together with, with, uh, uh, to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they carry you out. They, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. The example we want to look at this week is 
if I'm standing and I'm looking at CJ and I know, I know he won't repent. Sometimes the temptation is to say this. Yes, I know he's in sin, but he, man, he, that guy, he, he, CJ, if you just knew CJ, CJ is a hard-hearted joker. He's not going to repent if I say something to him. It doesn't matter. Matthew 18 doesn't say if you think that he's a candidate for this, more, any more so than when, when a sower goes forth to sow that he looks at a little patch of ground and says, well, I never really like that patch of ground. It doesn't look good. He, he just sows. When we go out to evangelism, we go out and we give the gospel to anybody we haven't come in contact with. When we're in the church and we're dealing with sin, we give, it to, we give the God's word to anybody who is subject to it. And if CJ is the meanest man in the church, and he's the toughest, and he will not repent, I'm still going to go to CJ, and I'm going to say, CJ, you have sinned. I'll let him give his answer. You notice Ananias didn't give the chance to answer. He just died. He got rebuked and died. Sapphira had a chance. And this is key. Sapphira, all she had to do when she came to Peter, and Peter said, did you sell the lamb for this much? All she had to do was not lie to the inspired man. Do we understand that they were lying to a man who showed forth the works of inspiration? Lying to a man today wouldn't even be the same as, as this right here. They are challenging the inspiration of these men by lying to them. He said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. But when she denied it, when she lied to him, she fell down dead. I go to CJ and I say, CJ, you have sinned. You stole from Johnny. And CJ says, no, I didn't. Oh, man, I failed. Have I failed at that point? If I go to CJ and I say, you, you stole from Johnny, and I know he stole from Johnny. I've got evidence he stole from Johnny. And I say, you stole from Johnny. He said, no, I didn't. Have I failed? Has God tasked me? Anything that we've studied so far in this series about church discipline, has God tasked me with the repentance of the other person? No. He's tasked me with addressing that person. He's tasked me with being biblical in the way I handle sin. Now, I've got some more steps I want to take with, with CJ. In Matthew 18, if, if I know of a personal sin, CJ stole my money. He doesn't want to admit it. What do I do next? We studied it. What do you do? Yeah, I'm going to bring witnesses. So I go and I get my two best friends and I tell them how bad CJ is and we go and we talk to CJ, right? No. I get two respectable uh, people in the Lord's church and I say, I want you to hear something out between CJ and me. And they hear it out and they say, Man, CJ, it sounds like he's got you, man. You, you stole his money. CJ says, I don't care. I'm not, I didn't do it. What do we do? Three of us get together and say, well, we tried. What do we do? Huh? You take it to the church. What's the, what's, we talked about this uh, right before we paused last time. What's the most effective way to take it before the church? Jump up there on Sunday morning and shout out CJ stole? How do, yeah, take it to the elders. The elders are the overseers of the church, so you take it to the elders. You say, elders, here's the two witnesses. I've sat down. I've tried to get CJ to repent. He won't repent. Here it is. Let them handle it, right? They're the shepherds. Hey, brothers, we got a, we got a thief among us, an impenitent thief among us. Let them handle it. They'll take care of it. Why do I continue with CJ, even if he won't repent? Because we'll, now the elders call him in, and they say, CJ, we want you to come in. We want Matthew to come in. We want the two witnesses to come in. And we want to all sit down together in a room, because we've got to figure this out, because someone's in sin here. Either Matthew and these witnesses are liars, and they've got a conspiracy against you, or you're a thief. And one way or the other, we've got to address this. Somebody here is sinning, and we don't allow sin to reign in the church. So someone's about to repent. Either the false accusers, because you're bearing false witness against a brother, or the brother who's a thief, because if, if they're telling the truth, you're a thief. So someone's going to, and so they bring us in, and it's evident, it's clear that, that CJ is a thief. He's, he's been stealing. 
And CJ says, I don't care. I didn't do it. CJ, here's all the evidence you did it, man. I don't care. Didn't do it. What are we going to do with CJ after we, after we admonish him to repent? Taking it all the way up to the level of the elders, what are we going to do with CJ? What are we going to do? You've been in the class. Oh, we're going to cover chapter 4 and 5. This is, the, this is the comprehension portion from what we've been studying. What will we do with our brother when we get to that level? What's the congregation going to do under the leadership of the eldership? What's the congregation going to do? Yeah, we're going to withdraw fellowship. No, but that's a trick question. No, we're not going to withdraw fellowship from him. You know why? It was, all a, it was all a fake setup because all the way back from the very beginning, you know what I did? I never did go to CJ. I just, I just badmouthed him and told everybody around me that he was a thief. So it never got to that point. We don't withdraw fellowship because we don't go to the brother. We don't withdraw fellowship because we don't go to the elders when we need to. We don't withdraw fellowship because we don't. You've got to do step one before you get to step three. And people say, uh, why don't we withdraw fellowship? Why, does, why don't churches withdraw fellowship? Well, hopefully because people are repenting when they sin. Hopefully that's the answer. But a lot of times it's because we don't take sin seriously when we see it. We don't address it on the personal level. It's got to be personal. Every single time sin occurs, it's personal. And it's got to be dealt biblically personal before it is dealt biblically congregationally. But yes, but yes, if we really did the right thing, if we really did approach, approach CJ, and we really did go through that channel, then yes, we would withdraw fellowship from CJ. Why? Because we hate him? Why would we withdraw fellowship from CJ at that point? I like that. We have two answers, and they're both correct, even though they're different answers. Church discipline saves the sinner. His last best hope is tough love at this point. So, yes, it's for him. When, it, when the scriptures talk about uh, 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 marking those who cause division among you, when the scriptures talk about uh, uh, not having fellowship, as a matter of fact, in Second John, that's one of the strongest uh, passages on this. When you go Second John chapter uh, verses nine through eleven, it's in Second John nine through eleven, he says, "What if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your home, nor greet him. Don't even greet him." He who greets him shares an evil deed. Here's it's in the specific context, some by false teachers. But the concept here being what. We have in another passage that says what? When you mark them, you avoid them, but what? Treat them as an enemy? Is that what the scriptures say? Do not treat him as an enemy. Is that time? Do not treat him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. But when we withdraw fellowship from CJ, and the eldership stands up and says, we're so sorry, but CJ is a thief, and he's refused to repent, what does that do for the congregation? It shows the congregation the seriousness of sin, and it saves their souls. All right, that's all our time for tonight.